All right. Well, thank you. I hope everyone had a nice time connecting over lunch. Welcome back. Um, we have the last two pre presentations here for our plenary session number five, uh, continuing with our clinical trial updates. I'd like to first welcome to the podium here An Nguyen from Ask Bios, uh, and he's going to speak about Lion 101, the study for the treatment of LGMD 2i R9. Thank you. My, my name is Ang Nguyen. I'm the Global Vice President Therapeutic Head at AskBio for the Rare Disease Neuromuscular and Musculoskeletal Programs. Uh, as a disclosure, I am an employee of, uh, of AskBio, and these are forward-looking statements. So just a little bit about AskBio. Uh, we are an early-stage R&D company, which was first to do a lot of different things around neuroscience, intrathecal delivery, treatment of rare diseases. Thank you. We've also had progress around uh, rare disease, neuromuscular like pompous disease, limb girdle, uh, more common pathway diseases like congestive heart failure, as well as neuroscience programs. I think what makes AskBio interesting is our discovery engine, which surrounds next generation capsid design, uh, next generation promoters, research around redosing, uh, as well as gene editing and synthetic DNA manufacturing. And so we do have manufacturing facilities globally. Uh, in, in Spain, we do have, again, the, a discussion around the synthetic DNA manufacturing and scalable manufacturing processes. And so we're, today we're talking about 2IR9. As you know, the, it, it is a, the prevalence global is about five per million. Uh, there are multiple interventional studies running right now, and we're very excited that uh, basically the, the tides right, raise all boats. Uh, we're focusing today on our part one of our current uh, active enrolling trial, a uh, phase one for, for the treatment of 2IR9. And so what would made 2IR9 interesting to us uh, at AskBio was the significant burdens to both the patients themselves and their caregivers, as well as the uh, prevalence of respiratory and cardiac disease. And we felt as, as a portfolio company of Bayer that we wanted to focus on this rare disease, also looked with a long-term focus around treatments for, uh, again, the, these sort of systemic uh, manifestations. Uh, so 2IR9, as, as you know, is a, an enzyme deficiency. Either you have a defective FKRP enzyme or not enough of it. And so imagine that uh, basically with the FKRP, you glycosate sugar coat the subunit of the DGC, the dystrophin glycoprotein, glycoprotein complex, sort of like branches on a, uh, on a tree. And these branches will help you catch uh, basically the surrounding tissues to help form muscle fibers as well as muscle bundles. And if you have a deficiency of, of the FKRP enzyme or not enough of it, you basically have lost these branches. You can't stick to surrounding tissues, right? And so this creates this wear and tear phenomena. Uh, we believe that, that 2IR9, because it's one of the more common, it's the fourth most common LGMD, that it was a great anchor for us to move more into, into this therapeutic area. And so what makes this uh, construct for, for the Ask Bio construct interesting is it's a self-complementary AEV technology that uses double-stranded DNA as well as a next-generation promoter, which allows us to have more selectivity for striated tissue, muscle tissue, including voluntary muscle, the heart, as well as the diaphragm. Uh, AEVs, as you know, are considered not known to cause uh, human disease. Uh, and you know, with our third-generation capsid, we're using an AEV9, uh, which is, has a selectivity for muscle tissue, uh, we believe that we have improved uh, signal transduction and, and transduction efficiency with our construct and allows us to basically use lower dose uh, of therapy in order to, to get the outcomes that we want. Uh, AEV technologies and, and, and our construct, uh, they, they basically do not have uh, insertional mutagenesis, which basically means it doesn't insert into the, into the uh, basically the, uh, in, into the, the chromosomes. So we did do uh, multiple preclinical studies and essentially using our construct uh, within the, the disease models, we were able to demonstrate basically restoration of uh, muscle strength and, and exercise endurance within these preclinical models at, at different dose levels. As you can see, essentially near functional restoration, 75% 
of, of wild type function in the lower dose and up to 90% in the higher dose. And so th this uh, basically helped us uh, decide to advance the program into, what the, into the currently uh, phase one program, which is actively enrolling. Uh, essentially, we're focusing on an adult homozygous population, uh, 2IR9, to find the correct dose or identify the correct dose to advance the program into, towards a confirmatory study. And so the part one of the program right now is to evaluate safety of the, the line 101 uh, gene therapeutic product, as well as assess uh, basic clinical endpoints of interest to move forward to advance the program uh, and for the purposes of regulatory interactions. And so this is where we're at right now. We are actively uh, enrolling and, and have already dosed uh, patients. And so we're excited to hopefully have a readout for you sometime around next, next year. And so designing these uh, genetic medicines and, and in ultra-rare diseases are, uh, there, there's headwinds and tailwinds, and we see the landscape is shifting, especially with our colleagues at Sarepta using the accelerated approval pathway. Uh, we know that from natural history studies that the science continues to change. And what was used 15 years ago when the first natural history studies were being incorporated has shifted to different composite endpoints and functional outcomes. And we at, at Ask Bio, as well as the competitive landscape, are, it's, it's, we're, we're constantly reassessing ways to find what is clinical benefit, what does, what does clinically meaningful mean to, to patients, their caregivers, and how does that translate over to from a, a regulatory science framework. We also realize that, you know, what do patients and, and their caregivers want, right? And, Really, I think restoration and improvement and, and function is really a primary goal, and that is something that we want to support uh, with, with our genetic medicines. Likewise, we are quite aware of the burden to patients and their caregivers, uh, and ultimately it's important for us to think about these things as, as the larger picture, and not, not only just in the context of a clinical trial, but over, you know, over a lifetime. From a scientific perspective, uh, around these accelerated approval endpoints and, and development of assays, uh, AskBio we did present at uh, ASGCT last year and earlier this year regarding some of our assays, and we've shown that with the uh, incorporation of a construct that uh, we are able to provide improved expression of FKRP as well as mechanisms of action, which basically means we're able to sugarcoat the alpha DG subunit and, and improve uh, basically the, the expression of, of uh, glycosylation and laminin binding. So, As you know, during this conference, uh, there is an interest around uh, the movement towards an accelerated approval pathways and how to leverage them. Uh, again, this is a, an interesting time for us in the ecosystem to try to navigate this and at the same time also demonstrate value for, for not only the, the patient the caregivers, but also the clinical community. And so I think that it's, you know, at the end of the day, it, it takes a village. Uh, you know, the, the innovators can only do so much. It, it needs help. We need help from, from you, from the clinical community, from all the stakeholders to make sure that we can build therapies together. You can read more about us on clinicaltrials.gov. And I'd like to say thank you and a shout out to our clinical investigators. We have six sites in the United States. Uh, and please contact us at Ask Bio if you want to learn more. So thank you. Thank you for that. And next, I'd like to welcome Joanne Donovan from Edgewise Therapeutics as she discusses a novel approach to protecting muscle and DMD, B Becker muscular dystrophy, and the LGMDs. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you this afternoon. So as others uh, have, I, we have a uh, forward-looking slide with lots of small print, but basically it says that EDG5506 is an investigational agent, 
and it's not approved uh, anywhere. And I am the chief medical officer, uh, so have a conflict of interest there as well. So what are we doing at Edgewise? What we're trying to do is really go to the fundamental cause of many of these diseases, which is to protect the muscle, to allow it to remain intact. And in Duchenne, Becker, limb girdle, 2i, other limb girdles, there are particular muscle fibers that are more susceptible to damage because they lack the functional dystroglycan complex. There's a number of proteins in that complex, and any one of them causes the same problem, that the muscle is susceptible to contraction-induced damage. So what we've done is we have developed an investigational therapy that's designed to protect the susceptible muscle fibers from damage and preserve muscle function and allow it to potentially improve as well. So what we've seen is that in diseased animal models, EDG5506 protected susceptible muscle fibers and it prevented long-term damage, uh, the development of long-term damage. What we've now seen in clinical trials is that EDG5506 has shown decreases in biomarkers of muscle damage and shown trends towards functional improvement, as I'll show you. So the district like you've heard a lot about district like and complex. What it does is it provides support for the muscle during contraction. If the muscles weren't contracting, if they weren't functioning, then they wouldn't get damaged. But that's not going to do anybody any good because that's what muscles are for, to contract. And it's extreme contraction that causes the most damage. So I've listed a half a dozen uh, different diseases that lack specific proteins in the district glycan complex. The sarcoglycanopathies uh, do. Uh, LGMD2I, Duchenne, Becker also lack key proteins in that sequence. And what that sequence, what that protein complex does is it allows the distribution of force across the muscle when the muscle contracts. And without that, the muscle gets damaged. So we think of muscle fibers or muscles contracting all of the different units in the muscle, all the different fibers contracting at once, as you see here. And in this diagram, which is going to move, um, the green is essentially the dystroglycan complex or dystrophin. And what that, what actually muscle fibers don't contract like this. They don't go all at once. The nerve selects subsets of muscle fibers to contract. That one in the middle there is a fast muscle fiber. They tend to go ahead. And what happens is the dystroglycan complex connects the muscles in a way that it distributes the force across the muscle. And if it's lacking, then the muscle gets damaged. It, it is much easier for it to be damaged when it's acting on its own. It's like popping a, a thread from a rope versus the strength of the whole rope together. So that's what we're trying to protect against in all of these diseases. So, I am not going to show you a lot of, of animal data, but I think this is, is very instructive. And these are muscles, they're actually um, finger muscles from the MDX mouse, a, 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 a model of dystrophinopathy. And they, they're small enough that you can see through them in a light microscope without disrupting them. Uh, on the left is a dystrophic uh, muscle that is just undergoing damage. And as you see, as it, start, as it contracts, what happens is you see these little globules develop. Basically, the muscle gets, gets damaged and pops some of these muscle fibers. And so you can see all this visible damage. And when we pre-treat it with EDG5506, it still contracts. It completely protects against visible damage here. So that's what we're trying to accomplish. And there's a lot of animal studies that show decreases in biomarkers, long-term uh, improvements in fibrosis, but this is the crux of what we're trying to show. So 
you've heard about biomarkers that can be very helpful with regulatory submissions, and biomarkers are, are a big part of that. So when the muscle is injured, the membrane is damaged, and the, the proteins inside the muscle leak out. So there's a number of these muscles, creatine kinase that you've heard of, myoglobin uh, is another uh, protein that leaks out, uh, as well as ones that are particular to the fast muscle fibers that are damaged most easily, fast troponin. And there's a whole panel of other proteins that we can look at for the kind of the fingerprint in the bloodstream of what's happening to muscle fibers. So that's what we can look at in a clinical study without necessarily biopsying the muscle. So we took EDG 5506 into the clinic. And we looked in unaffected adults. We looked also in adults with Becker muscular dystrophy because they have elevations in these biomarkers. And we could watch those over a period of time, even in a phase one study. And the, the, the gentlemen who participated in the study get a gold star for staying in a phase one unit. This is the hardest part on a patient for, the, for clinical trials, but they had to stay in the unit and get poked and prodded and blood drawn for two weeks to understand what is happening in the earliest stages of drug development. So what we saw, and we've continued to see, is the drug is well tolerated. The most common side effects are dizziness, which is actually a funny feeling, and it may actually be related to the effect on the muscle. It just feels a little bit different when you are moving around. Um, and what we have uh, continued to see is that's a, that's a transient phenomena. So it's, pretty, it's very well tolerated. Uh, dizziness and, and a little bit of sleepiness, we give it at night, and that hasn't been an issue. It can be taken orally. So this is a, in some ways, a low-tech approach. This is a drug that is taken as a tablet every morning. And it is, can be taken with or without food. Importantly, we look to see whether it gets to the muscle. So it gets absorbed well. Is it getting to where it needs to be? And when we did muscle biopsies, and this is actually the only place in the program we've done muscle biopsies, we saw that the drug was about 100 times more concentrated in the muscle than it is in plasma. It's virtually the only place it goes in the body. And that tells us that it's getting to where it needs to be. That's kind of 101 for drug development, make sure the drug can get there. So those patients um, it continued in an open-label study um, for now up to 24 months. And that's to look at safety and to also look at functional measures over the long term. I didn't mention we did see the biomarkers go down even in those two weeks. So these are, are men who are between 18 and 55 that are uh, ambulatory. Uh, and they, what we knew from looking at their baseline function is that they had significant deterioration of their function. Uh, they had lost a significant number of ambulatory functions. Half of them couldn't get off the floor to rise from uh, to standing, uh, having trouble getting up out of chairs, steps. So these were, were men who had, had, had significant disease. Um, and we looked at function over time. Um, so over 12 months, uh, what we've seen, and the, they're continuing uh, to receive drug uh, now, but what we've seen is that the CK uh, goes down substantially. Uh, it goes down very much at the beginning and stays down. We also see the specific marker of the type of muscle fibers that are most sensitive, the fast muscle fibers. That goes down 80%. Again, it goes down at the beginning, it stays down, it's highly statistically significant. So it's very helpful to have these kind of biomarkers to be able to look at, at how, what dose we should use in a clinical trial. And we also looked at functional measures, and you've heard about the North Star that looks at measures of ambulatory function uh, in these men. Uh, a number of 17 different measures, the top score is 34, the bottom score is zero. And on, at the beginning, they were about 15. So you can see fairly um, uh, far down on that scale, unfortunately. 
So the blue line on the top is the natural history, is the, is the people on the drug. So they actually were stable and t trended to improve over this period of time. What we know from the natural history, the purple line, is you would have expected them to go down meaningfully during that, that time. This is a disease that develops over 10 years, 20 years. So doing that every year obviously gets you to a place where you don't want to be. So there is a, a, a meaningful difference even in a year. Now this is open label. This is, is a dozen patients. But what we have done with this is then be able to design uh, additional studies. And we have, uh, this is the ART study that I just talked about. We have fully enrolled, actually, the largest study in Becker to date, 69 adults and adolescents just finished recruiting. That's going to give us more information in a placebo-controlled way uh, to further uh, enhance the design of the Grand Canyon study, which is a pivotal study, meaning that's a study that we can take to the FDA with a functional endpoint for a full approval. We also have an initial uh, biomarker study in limb girdle 2i. Uh, you heard from Dr. Vissing this morning. Uh, that is enrolling uh, in his group and looking not just at Becker, but also at other muscle diseases, also at limb girdle 2i. He had shown before that you see muscle contraction induced damage in limb girdle 2i, lacking a dystroglycan complex. So we're looking at that as well. Uh, and McArdle, which is a glycogen storage disease, but again, has contraction-induced damage. We're also looking at in boys with Duchenne uh, in the Lynx uh, study, and that is actively uh, enrolling. So to summarize, EDG 5506, it's designed to reduce contraction-induced damage in a type of skeletal muscle fiber that's particularly prone to damage. And in this way, it may be able to modify disease progression in individuals with several types of neuromuscular diseases. It's only, you heard about a platform. We'd like to develop, in general, kind of a drugs that can work in across diseases. These are all rare diseases. How can we develop something that will work in multiple diseases? And we think this has the potential to do so. Um, it's a novel mechanism of action, um, and it potentially can be used alone or in combination with other therapeutic approaches. In fact, we just announced uh, opening a study in Duchenne in boys that have previously uh, received uh, uh, gene therapy. Um, so that is, is also going to be starting up in the very near future. So we see this as a, a foundational um, uh, molecule uh, in neuromuscular disease. So with that, I'd like to thank you for, for listening. I thank the patients in the studies. Um, you can get more information uh, at studies at edgewisetx.com. And there's also a number of um, recordings there that go into more detail uh, with myself, with, with uh, the chief scientific officer, Alan Russell, as well, uh, if you want to listen to it at your leisure. So with that, thank you. Um, be around to answer.